Would you like to show Jesus you love him? Of course you would, right? Would you like to show God the creator that you love him? Show him with an action, not just by uh, a Christian t-shirt or a friendly um, you know, prayer in public, but actually show God that you love him? I'm here to tell you today it's possible. In fact, it's in the Bible. And so if you spend a few minutes with me, we'll go through and figure out how you can show Jesus you love him today and every day. If you have your Bible, turn to John 14, verse 21. John 14, verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Today's message is all about growing close to Jesus. Now, what would it mean to be close to God, our creator? What in your mind could you imagine would be some benefits of being close to God? You know, you hear uh, people saying, oh, you're, you know, you're in the ministry or you go to church a lot. You must be close to God. But, you know, if you've been around the ministry or if you've been in church for a long time, you know that that's not necessarily the case. That oftentimes people that are in church aren't close to God. They're just in church trying to get close to God. But there's this thing blocking them. There's this space, this divide. And uh, it happens really to all of us, if we're honest, that we can easily drift away from the Lord. Not him drifting from us, but us drifting from him. Why? Because we don't follow his commands. And one of his commands shows us how to get close to him. Uh, In John 14, 21, it's Jesus speaking. This is the red letters in your Bible. And Jesus is proclaiming that those that keep his commandments, that have them and they keep them, they understand them, they keep them, they're the ones that love them. And those that love them will be loved by Jesus and by the Father. And will have manifest Jesus manifested in themselves. So God will be living within the believer that shows God that he loves them through keeping his commandments. Now that all may sound scriptural and proper and so forth, but it's actually quite simple. So we're just going to go through this today and and, uh, realize that we can be close to God, our creator, And that the benefits of being close to God, our creator, are many. And, uh, you know, look, if you want anybody on your side, you want God on your side. If you want anybody that you can turn to, you want God to turn to. And God gives everyone, everybody, an equal opportunity to do this. Some choose to do it, and many, many don't. They find themselves too busy, or they make themselves too busy. They become purposefully ignorant. They try to just ignore it, think about other things. Why? Because that's what their uh, fleshly desires want them to do, and that's what the world will help back up and reinforce. Uh, Yet here in God's Word, we have a simple process for getting close to the Lord and for showing Him we love Him, which has great fruit attached to it. Uh, So let's just start by looking at what it means to have a relationship. Uh, Relationships take work, do they not? Can I get an amen on that one? I've been married, it'll be seven years in July. July 10th, 2013, I got married. And uh, it's been a wonderful marriage. It's been the best years of my life. And it's absolutely taken a lot of work. Our marriage takes work. Everyone's marriage takes work. Uh, What does work mean? Well, it means uh, changing our behaviors, changing our attitudes, changing our schedules, changing our routines. It means compromising who we are to better get along with who they are. Well, guess what? That's the same way it is with the Lord. I believe the Lord gave us these earthly relationships to help us understand what it's like having a relationship with him how we have to change how we are and how we have to work at it and how we have to make it a priority and how we have to sacrifice. Now think about that word sacrifice for a minute. Think about the people you're closest to in your life. What do you have to do to maintain that closeness with them? What sacrifices do you have to make? You know, when I met my wife early on, I I just was smitten with her. I was just, I just was never... Uh, had met anyone like her. She was so unique and just special that I realized that I needed to sacrifice any relationship that could harm the relationship with her, right? 
And so I did that. I remember purposely just keeping my entire focus on her and not veering one way or another uh, or or getting involved in things that were would um, make her go away or distance myself from her. And it's not always just trying to talk to another girl or another woman. It could be things like hanging out with a bad crowd or choosing to hang out with other people when I would be spending time with her. I do chose all these things to make these sacrifices to make it clear to her that I loved her. Now here with the Lord, he's asking us to do the same thing because we love him. We should sacrifice for him because we love him. We should carve out time in our day for him because we love him we should turn to him for advice because we love him we should turn away from the things that he doesn't like does that make sense i hope it does and so i've got a very simple three-point message here to help us grow closer to the lord to have that close tight-knit relationship with god not because uh it's you know we're commanded to but because we're shown that if we do uh if we have this close relationship with the Lord, will reap great benefits from it. And so going back to the scripture, the beginning says, he that hath my commandments. And so the first question is, if Jesus is saying, he that hath my commandments, what are his commandments? And uh, I think that's a very valid question. You know, are they the 10 commandments, uh, like from what Moses put on the stone? Are they other commandments we read in the Bible? Are they the laws in Leviticus? Are they what the apostles were saying? Is it something else? Uh, you know, we're going to look at Jesus' commandments. We're typically going to look at the things that he commanded of people. Uh, and he made many commandments. Uh, some of them, I'll give you a few examples, make disciples. Matthew 28, 19 through 20, uh, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Uh, watch and pray, Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's Matthew 26, 41. Love the Lord. Jesus said unto him, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first great commandment. This is um, or this is the first and great commandment. Matthew 22, 37 through 38. Love your neighbor. As the second commandment is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Be a house of prayer. It is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Uh, Matthew 21, 13. So we have a lot of these commandments uh, at, at our church service on Sunday. I printed out this really neat list of 49 of, of uh, Jesus' commandments and um, handed them out to the church. And I encourage the church to study these commandments because the first step to understand here in the sequence of events uh, in this verse, you know, if we're looking at this verse like a treasure map, okay, we're looking at our path to receive our treasure. Our path is to have the commandments. That's the first part. And so we need to understand what they are. Uh, so if you um, spend some time looking through the Bible, looking through uh, the, the, the gospels like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, you'll see a lot of what Jesus is uh, commanding his followers to do. And take those literal, take those ac actually literal. So the five that I mentioned, make disciples truly Purpose yourself to make disciples, to work with people, discipling them to be like Christ. And that's how you're like Christ. You're discipling them to be like Christ. And if you're not a teacher, then you need to really focus on forming your life to be an example of Christ. And then you can say, look, I'm not the greatest teacher, but if you look at my life and you look at my conduct, I'm living how the Lord's called me to live. All, with all humility, we all fall short, but you get the idea watch and pray. We're called to watch and pray that we enter not into temptation. Lord, have mercy. This is one, a big one uh, that we all struggle with every day. I believe this every day. There are good and bad things happening. The Lord is blessing. The devil's tempting and the Lord is blessing and the devil's tempting. And we're kind of at that crossroads. Uh, you know, should I do this? Should I do that? Oh, this would seem really good to me, but is it okay with God? Or do we even pass it by God? We just run and do these things. So we need to watch and pray. We need to be mindful of what's happening. And we need to pray to the Lord saying, God, let us not enter into temptation. That's another commandment. And we need to do that daily or even multiple times a day. Because as the verse says, the flesh is weak. The spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus is commanding us to watch and pray because he knows our form. He knows we're made out of the dirt. He knows we have a sin nature. He knows that we 
are likely to drift afar if we are not watching and praying. Love the Lord, another commandment that we are called to love the Lord with all our heart and soul and mind. And uh, we this this message here is all about loving the Lord. So we're learning how to do that. Again, we're going to live this out every day. Uh, love your neighbor, much easier said than done. Oftentimes there are things we would like and we don't want our neighbor to have, or there are things that we hoard to ourselves, or there are there problems, disputes with our neighbor that we don't want to forgive, but if it was us on the other way around, we'd want them to forgive us. Lord, help us love our neighbor. It's something we need to work on daily and be in a house of prayer, not just saying prayers like the Pharisees and scribes did to make themselves look good out loud, but fervently praying, praying on our knees, getting down on our faces and calling out to God passionately with urgency. If you've never prayed like that, I'm, I'm telling you, do that today. Uh, matter of fact, right now, if you want to just hit pause and just start praying to the Lord with fervency, get after it. If not, after the message, however you want to do it, I really urge you to pray to God to really fervently seek his will uh, and his face. To it's There's nothing like just getting it all out and just absolutely uh, fervent prayer, enthusiastic prayer. Uh, but we're called to do this. These are our, our commandments. And there's so many more. And so Number one is understanding what they are. So, so I'll give you five here and you can search uh, online to do research about G what are Jesus commandments or uh, find a list like the 49 commandments that I handed out. Uh, you can also read in your Bible, the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, get these commandments in your head. Once you have these commandments, now we need to really look at what it means uh, when Jesus says having commandments, right? Because you have commandments in your mind, you might have memorized them, but is that enough? I mean, if if we're going to possess something and really own it, we need to look at what that means. And, and I think there's a few things that, as I've kind of alluded to, we need to be careful of. Uh, number one, we need to have enough respect for him, for the Lord Jesus Christ, that we make it a priority. Uh, oftentimes, uh, we will make a priority the things that we respect or fearful of or things that we kind of endear will make it a priority. Uh, if you were to have a very important guest over, let's say a U.S. senator was coming to your house for dinner, you would probably make it a priority to clean your house and have everything in order because an important person was coming. Well, there's no one more important than our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, he made the earth, he made us, he made everything. He died for our sins. Hallelujah. His blood set us free. And so we have to have enough respect for him and that respect of, of what he bought with our with his blood. He, he bought our sin debt and we no longer are our own. Once we accept Jesus as Savior and we purpose in our hearts to that, that, that uh, Jesus is Lord because we were sinful and we are sinful, but we, we were so sinful that we can never uh, make, uh, never achieve the law, make the law, never keep the law. And so therefore, Jesus had to die on, our cross, die on the cross on Calvary for our sins. And when he did that, that was the great atonement. That was the propitiation for our sins. And he was buried three days and then rose again, uh, walked the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and then ascended up to the right hand of the Father. And when we accept that, we believe that in our heart of hearts, we truly believe it. That's when we have that respect for him, that we make it a priority. Number two, we must trust him that it's what's best for us, even if our hearts tell us otherwise. Often these commandments will conflict with what our hearts are telling us. If I want to open a coffee shop, I love coffee. If I want to open a coffee shop and my heart says, that's a great idea, you know, that's going to be wonderful, just this really great coffee shop. And God, the Spirit, saying, no, I want you to preach my word. Don't open the coffee shop. Well, my heart's telling me one thing and the Spirit's telling me another thing. We must trust Him in a situation like that that he will give us what's best for us. And we must crucify that desire. So we have to trust him. You know, think about it. If you are lost uh, in the woods and you have a, a, a friend with you that is a great navigator and you feel like we've got to go right, we've got to go right, we've got to go uh, to the right, we've got to go uh, north, okay? And your friend is telling you, no, I know what I'm doing and it's south. 
Well, you have to trust your friend enough to overcome your own instincts. And so we have to trust the Lord enough to come, overcome our deceitful and deceiving hearts. Uh, number three, we must love him so that when temptation comes to break these commandments, we can carry through. That's having that deep love and adoration for the Lord that when something comes our way, we say, nope, we are not going to engage in this. There's, this is sinful or covetous or this is uh, uh, evil. We're not going to engage in it. We love the Lord so much. We can't stand the thought of hurting him. We know what he did for us on the cross. We know what a good father he is. We know how great he is. And we know our purpose here is to glorify him. So we're going to turn from this bad thing. We're going to love him so much and carry through with these commandments. And then number four, we must know him for them to be effective. Uh, we must be eternally saved. We must accept Christ as our savior. As I outlined just a few minutes ago, we must accept him as our savior or else we're not born again which is one of his commandments, that we must be born again. Uh, so that's just uh, some four traits that I listed, faith, hope, love, charity. And is this not who our father is? So when we look at what Jesus is saying by have my commandments, he's, he's really saying, be like me. We're asked to be like Christ. We're asked to trust and to love and to respect and to know him to have that faith, right? To have that hope in him over the worldly things, to have that love for him that he had for us and to have that, that charity about us, that sacrificial attitude about us to do what's best for the cause of Christ over our own desires. We're being asked to be like Christ. So we need to be careful not to make this process so academic or rigid that we keep our hearts out of it. You know, the heart's an interesting thing. I mentioned it can deceive you, but it also can convince you. Uh, you know, I'll tell you a story here. I like to use my kids as examples because, hey, they're my kids. I can do that. And uh, I love them. I'm raising them up in the Lord as the, as the Bible uh, commands me to. Uh, and uh, Jenny Rose, my daughter, she's three. She's about to be four at the end of the month. Um, she had a real problem in the last year or so when she's in a full child seat, uh, she had a real problem with unbuckling the top part of her child seat. And she would just do it. We would tell her over and over again in the car, Jenny Rose, you can't do that. Well, if you can imagine a car with three rows, and if I'm driving and she's in the third row, that's a problem. I can't reach her. So it was a, it was getting to the point where uh, I'd have to pull over to fix it, or we'd have to double check. And it was, it was getting bad. And, and, and she understood she wasn't supposed to do it, but she kept doing it. She had a head knowledge, but she didn't have that heart knowledge. Well, one day uh, I was talking to my wife. I said, look, we need to do something about this. And we came up with this idea of, of going online and pulling up a video of a crash test. And we found an old video of a crash test uh, dummy of a, like an old Oldsmobile or something going up and hitting a wall at a high speed. And the crash test dummy is a baby in a car seat with the, with the uh, buckles undone. And that baby goes flying through the windshield. We showed that to my three and a half year old daughter one time and everything changed. She got it. She understood. Now when we're backing the car out of the driveway, she won't even let us back it out until everything is buckled. She'll scream. She's absolutely committed to keeping everything buckled. She knows what happened to that baby. She understands. And now she has a heart knowledge. She is completely convinced that this commandment of ours as a family is best for her. See, as humans, we're predisposed to self-preservation. So the aha moment for Jenny Rose was visually seeing that baby flying into the wall. And she got it. She understood that she wanted to protect herself. It made her scared to think of what would happen if she was unbuckled. Well, friend, we should be scared of what would happen if we don't follow God's commands for our lives. We should be uh, respectful and loving towards our Lord and Savior because he is a fearful God. He, If you read the Bible, you start reading the Old Testament, and then you start reading in the New Testament how things will be worse than when they were in the Old Testament. You see how graphic things are and you see how powerful our God is, it is, it's not something to take lightly. And so we need to have the heart knowledge that these commandments are not just like little suggestions, but they truly are for our self-preservation and they truly are from an almighty sovereign Lord. 
and we need to take it very serious. And, and, you know, there, I believe ways the Lord shows us these things. Like we were able to sit there and visually show Jenny Rose, the video, I believe there's ways the Lord can impress upon us. Maybe this listening to this recording will do it. Maybe there's something else you need to go through or the Lord will impress upon you that how serious his commandments are, that we should follow them, that we should honor them and that we should not go the way the devil would have us go for our own good. These are for our own good. So we're reverencing God, but he is so merciful and wonderful that everything that he's calling us to do is for our own good. Uh, we really need to take it serious. So I've talked a little bit about having a heart knowledge, having the commandments that, you know, the scripture said to have them and to keep them. So I talk, talked about having them, but let's look at this idea of keeping the commandments. I think it's really interesting in scripture how Psalms, the book of Psalms starts out and who the Bible calls blessed. Psalm uh, chapter one, verse one and two. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. So Psalms 1 starts out talking about who we shouldn't be around so that we can keep his commandments. So we talked about having the commandments. Now we're talking about keeping them. Number one here in Psalms, it shows us Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. We don't need to be around those that are unsaved, those that are backslid, those that are living sinful lives, because it compromises our ability to keep these commandments. Remember, we're trying to show God we love him, and we learn the commandments, and we have the commandments, and now we're trying to keep them, and the very first First of the very first Psalm tells us, stay away from those that are going to compromise God's law. Because we know it's God's law because number two, this is, it says, but, right? So, but, so number one, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Verse two, but, right? So verse two is related to verse one, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. What's his, what is this blessed man's delight in? The law of the Lord, his commandments. And what does this man do? This blessed man do? In his law, he meditates day and night, all the time thinking of the Lord's commandments, God's law. That's who's blessed. I think it's very significant. This is the very first verse or two verses in the very first Psalm in the Bible. So we need to, number one, understand Stay away from the bad crowd because the bad crowd won't help us in this effort. And if anything, they'll hurt us. You know, the Bible says uh, a double minded man is unstable in all his ways. And we'll just constantly be letting both sides down. We won't be pleasing God and we won't be pleasing these people because we're half working towards God and half working towards pleasing them. And it's a no win situation and you'll be the most miserable person of them all. So you might as well just get rid of the bad crowd. Stop hanging around them. Stop making excuses for them. Just leave, walk away. It's what God calls us to do. Oh, but Brother Clark, it's family. Okay. Well, the Bible says that uh, it, the, the, the God's word will pit brother against brother, father against brother, mother against brother, sister against father. It's going to happen. God's word is going to divide the family. It says that the Lord Jesus Christ said that. So we should not let the fact that their family or coworkers or anything get in the way of our walk with God. And that doesn't mean that you have to surround yourself, say on the job where you can't control it around people that only are living for the Lord. What I'm saying is in the time that you are allotted to do what you're going to do, don't get around bad crowds and then don't complain that these bad crowds are bringing you down and they're not doing anything about it. You have to make the change. The crowd we hang out with is a reflection of who we are. So a bad crowd equals no peace to meditate on God's word. And on the other end, if you have a good crowd, now you're ready to focus on meditating on God's word. The idea is that we should spend time thinking about God's laws for our life, meditating on God's word, repeating it in our head, thinking about it, memorizing it, internalizing it, 
Uh, the good crowd would be people that would encourage you to do that, that are doing that themselves, that could help help you in that walk, that could help explain scripture to you, uh, that, that, that like to listen to uh, uplifting Christian music, that love to spend time in God's word, uh, that love to listen to preaching, that love to spend time with the Lord. That's a good crowd. Uh, so what does the world try to do to the Lord's commandments? I mentioned this idea that uh, the bad crowd is not good. But I just want to focus a little bit on the world as a whole. A lot of times when I'm preaching a message, I'll, I will just throw in this very simple, what does the world think of this kind of segment in the preaching? Because it's so easy to highlight the truth in God's word by showcasing the reality we live in, the terrible, awful, disgusting culture we live in. Well, the world, they'll try to ignore God's word and his commandments. They'll try to suppress them. They'll try to deny them. They'll try to rebel against them by breaking or attempting to falsely change them. And I, I can show you this literally. And then, of course, much of it is figurative as well. Uh, literally, one example is blue laws. You know, if you've ever gone to a state where alcohol is not for sale on Sunday or stores don't open on Sunday to shop in or they open at two o'clock or uh, the movie theaters closed or whatever it is. There were actually many laws throughout the whole country uh, called blue laws that go back uh, to the Puritan age that that were uh, really closed down business for that period of time on Sunday. And it was completely written in these laws. It was for the Sabbath. It was for rest. It was for restoration. It was because it was a holy day. And some of the laws, I think the one in North Carolina initially even stated for sinners to get right with God and for for individuals not to uh, use foul language and 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 uh, act sinfully. And so it was very much tied to uh, the Lord's command uh, for a Sabbath day, a day of rest on Sunday. Uh, and in Texas, which I considered a pretty Christian state for the most part, they repealed this law in 85. Uh, Virginia uh, re uh, overturned the law in 98. So a lot of these laws, modern day laws, were passed in the 60s and overturned in the 80s and 90s. And there's only one county in all of the country that still has a full blue law in place where no shopping, I think, I'm going to guess, essential, no non-essential shopping. So maybe grocery stores are open or gas stations, but malls and the such are not allowed, is Bergen County, New Jersey, which ironically is home to huge malls. So... They are a major shopping destination, but not on Sundays. And that's the only one left. Uh, everywhere else has either repealed them fully or partly. Uh, when I lived in South Carolina, there were still some blue laws in place and uh, so forth. So that's an example of the world turning over God's law, right? They're just over, literally overturning it. Another one would be uh, legalizing of gay marriage. On Wikipedia, put a quote on here on June 26, 2015. The U.S. Supreme Court struck down all state bans on same-sex marriage, legalized it in all 50 states, and then get this, they required the states to honor out-of-state same-sex marriage licenses. So in 2015, uh, basically, gay marriage became legal uh, nationwide and also became kind of binding in the sense that they could use these, uh, th these gay marriage certificates out of state uh, to to gain benefits. So you have another literal law, uh, God's law for man and woman uh, to be married in the traditional family and all these things is completely torn up here. And we're back to the days of Sodom and uh, you have that law. But it's not just literal laws. It's God's teaching in the Bible about all practices of life. Like God calls us to love our enemies you know, that's not a law. You know, it's not in law, written in law that we must love our enemies like um, like traditional marriage versus gay marriage or like the Sabbath day and blue laws. But still, God calls us to love our enemies. Uh, and yet the world thinks that that's a joke. The world uh, lusts for vengeance, right? Matthew 5, But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Well, I wonder if that's what you think when somebody does these things to you. Uh, when someone curses you, do you just say, oh, bless them. 
Uh, when someone hates you, do you say, how can I help them and do good to them? Uh, when someone despitefully uses you, like uses you and just like pushes you to the side, do you say, I'm going to pray for that person earnestly? If someone persecutes you, do you want to pray for them and bless them and, and, and uh, work, you know, petition God for good things to happen to them? Not exactly. Uh, but that's how God aims for us to act and live. It's not illegal to hate your enemies, but not in man's eyes. But with God, it's a commandment that we're to love our enemies truly and not just sarcastically, but truly love them. So this is something we can choose to think about, to study up on, to ponder, something that we can take and say, hey, let's make sure we are loving those that wish to do us harm. And again, that goes against so much of our human nature. But what does the world want to do? They want to humiliate their enemies, kill them, despise them, get revenge, etc. The world, the devil, literally wants to do the opposite of what God wants to do. So, you know, the key in keeping these commandments are one, meditate on the commandments and two, apply them. Uh, imagine I borrowed money from you and that money I paid for an ad in the newspaper that mocked you. Then you saw the ad, you came to get your money back. You're so mad. I told you, I'm not giving your money back. So now I've taken your money and I've mocked you with it. I've used you, I've despitefully used you with an ad that's making fun of you. And then when you came to get the money back, I told you I'm not giving it back. So now essentially I've, I've stolen from you. I've done you harm. I've insulted you. The godly response would be what? Forgiveness, grace, mercy, love. Is that how you'd act? Would you just drop down to your knees and pray for me? A forgiving tone, charitable love, humility. Would you say, hey, I can understand some of the things that you said about me in that ad. And I love you and I'm going to pray for you and don't worry about the money. Or would you say, lawsuit, I'm going to threaten you, I'm going to get you back, I've got anger, I'm going to get vengeance, I'm going to gossip about you, I'm going to use foul language against you, take legal action, I might even get violent with you. That's what the world wants you to do. But what good does it do to go the way of the world? Create enemies and you stress yourself out, you potentially lose more money on lawyers or whatever else, you lose valuable time. Maybe you hurt the other person and for what? What good does it do? What good does it do to go the way of the Lord? It teaches us patience, forgiveness as Christ died for our sins. And you have so many that live like they don't even want to know him. And he died for their sins. Love, humility. It's a good witness to others. Hey, you might even win that person to the Lord acting like that. You're, you're showcasing the love of Christ in you. So applying God's commandments, it's an act of faith. You were saying with your actions, you care enough, trust enough, love enough to put God's truths to work in your life, even though you want to react, you want to act the way of the flesh, you want to go the way of the world. You're saying, no, I have faith, Lord, that you know what you're talking about, that you know what's best for me, and I will live your commandments out. That is keeping the commandments, being in that furnace, that trial by fire and saying, I won't give up. I won't give in. Right. And you just go with God's commandments. Another example, imagine I adopted two teenagers uh, that I heard, uh, you know, once I adopted them, they were, uh, they had heard that I was interested in giving away my car since they both didn't work and were in need. I thought they both fit the bill. So I've adopted two teenagers. I don't know them very well. I said, hey, I'm going to give away my car to one of you. And uh, I'm looking at who to give it to. And I watched how they acted. And one of them uh, never talked to me, just kept busy doing his own thing, hanging out with his friends, uh, just was really, you know, could care less. It was just like I was just there to give him a bed. And the other son listened to me and talked with me, learned lessons I was trying to teach, and even shared those lessons with his friends and even started to act like me. When I decide to give that inheritance, who am I going to give it to? Who am I? I'm going to sit here and say, am I going to give it to one that cares about me or am I going to give it to one that doesn't? Am I going to give it to the one that's gotten to know me or the one that could care less? The one that institutes my teachings or the one that's too busy to be taught? Of course, I'm going to give it to the one that loves me, that shows me they love me by their actions. Jesus is showing us in this initial passage of scripture 
It is our actions, our daily walking in our lives that shows him who loves him. Show is an action. Walk is an action. It's not just words. It's not just intentions. It's not just a to-do list that never gets done. It's really actually trying. It's doing it. It's going through and, and being um, assertive and, and making it a priority and having reverence for the Lord and doing these things. Jesus is the greatest teacher ever, is he not? And as students, do we even know his commandments, his teaching for us? Are we passing the test? Are we even trying? God help us. In that example I gave you, the one son that showed he was trying, he was the one that had that relationship with me because he put in the effort. I was equal to both sons. I was the father equal to both sons. One put in the effort, one didn't. Now they're both adopted. They're both my sons, but one of them is going to have that closer relationship with me. Point three, the fruit of our labor, the love of God, the father and Jesus, our Lord. So why is it worth changing your ways to live like Christ? What's the benefit? Well, it, you know, one thing I love about God's word is a lot of times the Lord will use repetition to help get a point across. So in John 14, if you didn't get the point in the first bit of scripture, a couple of verses down, here it is, John 14, 23, he reiterates, Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. And Jesus means by we, that's God, the father and God, the son. And then you got the Holy Spirit. That's the abode, the abiding inside of you. That's the Holy Trinity. So in John 14, 23, it shows again, if a man love me, he will keep my words. Look, if you love the Lord, you can't just be a Sunday only Christian. You can't just be a one verse a week Christian. You have to get into his word and not just read it, but act it out and try your very best to live it. Why is it worth changing your ways to live like Christ? What's the benefit? The benefit is having the love of the Father inside of you. Abode. This verse says, abode, my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Abode is a uh, definition is a place of continuance, a dwelling, a habitation. So look, you, you want the Lord living in you for a day when you get saved. You want the Lord living with you for eternity when you get saved. That's great. But how do you develop that relationship with the Lord where he's guiding you day to day in this awful, sinful world? You develop that through this daily walk with the Lord, having his continuance, his dwelling, his habitation inside of you. If we work to have, to understand in our hearts and to keep, to put into action continually the Lord's commandments, we get God continually dwelling within us. I can't think of a better reward for putting God's truth into action in our lives. Is that not the epitome of closeness? Who are you closest to in a literal sense? The people you live with. So you want to be close to God? Wouldn't it be great to have that close relationship to God with him living within you? That's to be the best possible thing on earth. Look, I know when you're saved, the Holy Spirit enters you and you're saved. I get that. But you can, the Bible says you can grieve the Holy Spirit and sin creates a distance between the Lord. So just because we're saved does not give us the right to live like the world itself. In fact, if we do that, we are making, we are showing God that Christ's sacrifice was not enough and that, that we that we don't appreciate it, respect it, understand it, and are fully committed to it. And so we have to be close to God uh, in our actions and not something just passive. And you'll hear a lot of uh, you know folks in the ministry say, if someone's living like the world and hasn't changed at all and they're quote unquote saved, you know they may not have salvation. Why? Because when you're saved, a change takes place. Hurting God and sin, it should eat you up. It should tear you up. If you're able to just sin freely and just live like the world and, and mock the things of God, then you know, you, you, you're know you either grieving the Holy Spirit or you're not even saved. And so we need to live for the Lord because that's our duty as Christians. You know, we're bought with a price. You know, we're not saved by works, but we grow close to the Lord by our works. And it shows our faith by our works. It's an action. We don't just happen upon this declaration of being close to God by chance. If you ever met someone, you said, wow, they're really close to God. It's not just like 
God snapped his fingers and they became close to God. They're close to God because they're staying in his word. They're staying in his commandments. They're having their his commandments in their heart. They have that heart knowledge and they're keeping those commandments. And that's how they're having that love of the father and dwelling them and, and helping guide them. And that's how that is. And, and the Bible says we should work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. We're each called to do this. We're each called to work uh, through our issues as fleshly uh, uh, flawed humans to get close to living for the Lord. So what motivates action? Uh, love, you know, he died for us, so we should live for him, John three sixteen. Fear, we are wise to follow his commands. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, Proverbs 1, 7. God loves you. I know I'm a broken record here, but it's true. He loves you. He loves you so much that he gave you these commandments for your own good, that he sent his son to die for your good, that he has pardoned your sins for your good. He's a mighty God. He gives us energy and air to breathe. And he gives us food and he gives us a bed to sleep on. He does all this stuff for us. He gives us all these things. And what do we do to thank him? Do we even turn to him or do we just cast it all aside and say, well, Lord, you'll understand. You're great. And don't worry about it. No, we need to make him a priority. And, you know, the Bible has a way of kind of phrasing this. And, and I'll just, I won't spend too, too much time on this, but, but understand the bot, that God knows everything and is perfect. So there's nothing that you can get past God or trick God with. He knows it all. And he has put in his word, this idea of spiritual adultery. And what that is, is having idols and having false gods in your heart that take the place of the true God, of our God, of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so anything, you know, it doesn't have to be like some statue or shrine, it might be um, a brand, you know, it might be an Apple computer, or an iPhone, it might be a sports team, it might be uh, food, it might be cars, it might be work, it might be a loved one, it, it might be a hobby, it might be anything. And if it's not God, and it's in our heart, and that's what fires us up, and that's what we want to live for, and that's what we're passionate about, and that's what we're known for, and our whole life is revolving around this thing that is not our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we need a heart check because the Bible clearly commands us to not have any idols. That Our Lord is a jealous God. We should not have any idols. So we need to crucify those desires. Now, hey, is it wrong to have interests? I don't believe it is, but I believe it's very smart to get your heart right with the Lord while we're here on earth, while we have the ability to do so. You know, I woke up the other day and uh, was having one of those days that was not a great day. I uh, just felt anxious and just didn't have a lot of answers to things that were on my mind. Decisions that probably would seem maybe small or big to you, but felt real big to me. And I told my wife, I said, I, I just need to get into God's word. I, I just need to read. And I didn't even know what I was going to read or I just, you know, I, I was trying to finish the book of Luke for our reading plan in church. Uh, and so I started there and just kind of kept reading. And um, I just had to get into God's word. And, and what I'm trying to point out to you is that this is a very difficult thing uh, that we do as believers, this walk that we have as believers to be separate, to be holy, to be set apart, and that we need to turn to the scriptures and we need to turn to God, our father, not our hearts, not our, our uh, friends with good opinions or whatever, we need to turn to God and we need to get in the word of God and study the word of God to understand how we should live. We need to have the Lord Jesus Christ's commandments. We need to keep those commandments, have that heart knowledge, keep them, follow them so we can be close to him. That's the start of all wisdom is the fear of God, understanding where our true love and hope and guidance comes from. And I pray that you can commit to having and keeping his commandments. I hope you can. You need this. I need this. We all need it to be close to the Lord. Uh, and I told my church on Sunday that, you know, I'm their pastor and I need them to be close to the Lord because that's my job. We have the truth, but what will we do with it? You know, when we Jesus is manifested to us, we live so much better here on earth and we will face judgment and we'll have more rewards in heaven for doing it. So I pray with, with my whole heart that you take this message seriously, that you know that 
your worth here on earth uh, is in Christ, and it will be for an eternity. Uh, our Lord is so worthy, and I'm just praying that you are tenderhearted and humble and earnestly seeking him. It's within us all, uh, but you know you have to take that step. And my question is, will you be the one that seeks him? I hope and pray. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this message. Thank you for the listeners being so attentive today, Lord. I pray that this reaches them in their depths of their hearts, Lord, and they live to serve you forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen.